spend the money making Pamela Stevenson look like you. I think they should have spent the money making you look like her. <laughs> so I learned my lesson, and after that, I never repeated scripts. I never rehashed ideas. It's not worth it. You'll bore people, you'll get punished in all sorts of ways. The other thing that's always very important is to be yourself. Write your own material, use your own ideas, use your own words. And I learned that not just from television, but from conferences, from giving talks like this, where I often chair conferences and give lectures and so on. And I think I learned it particularly when I was doing a couple of government road shows around the country in about 12 different locations. One of them was on the science of energy efficiency, and one was on the science of recycling. Now, I would be chairing it, but always there was a keynote speech from a minister from the scientific department. Then the rest of the day, various scientists would get up, often very young and inexperienced, to talk about their work. Now, the ministers always had their speeches written by their underlings. They always came with loads of assistants, and they always were too, far too busy to write their own speeches. And they were very polished and professional, but they weren't memorable. Whereas the young scientists would come up, often terribly inexperienced and nervous, but they were talking about their own work in their own words, and they were the people who were memorable. And obviously, when you are doing things in the public, you know this from every scientist you can think of who does things in the public, you have an image. Heinz Wolf, who you listened to this morning, he has an image, doesn't he? Well, I discovered fairly recently what my image is after 20 years on Tomorrow's World. I'd been working with this man, and he was married to a female politician. He said, oh, you'd love to meet her. Why don't you come along and have lunch? And I'm sitting there in their house, and their Jack Russell Terriers were roaring around, and I was just sitting on the sofa talking about their dogs. And this female politician is leaning forward, staring at me like this. It was so weird that I said to her, is anything wrong? She said, oh, forgive me. It's just that whenever I hear your voice, I feel I've got to concentrate because you're bound to be talking about something complicated like DNA. <laughs> and that's my image, talking about genetic engineering, DNA, complicated things. But once you've got an image, you can't lose it. And I'm quite happy with it. So you must also be real and you must be relevant. So if you're going out there to talk to the public, watch and see what's on the news that day. Listen to the radio, watch the television, look at the newspaper. You'll find there'll be something going on that is relevant to what you're talking about. And use stories and anecdotes, anecdotes about what's happened to you on the way up if it's relevant. On this particular road show, the energy efficiency one I was telling you about, I was traveling to all the locations by train, of course, because it's energy efficient. And when I got to the station, one of the, um, one of the locations, it had been snowing and it was a really filthy day and there was lots of slush around. But it was quite a long way to the conference center. So I thought, I'm going to have to get a taxi. If I can find some people who are also go to the conference, that'll be energy efficient. We can all share the taxi. So I, I gathered together a few likely looking people, and we all bundled in this taxi. And the driver said, oh, what are you all doing then? So I explained we were going to this conference on energy efficiency. And he said, I'm very interested in all of that. I really do believe in making my home energy efficient for a start. And I've been insulating the roof and the walls and putting in double glazing. And I think it's really important. And he said, I felt really proud this morning when I drove away from home for work. And I looked back, and I live in the middle of a terrace, and my house was the only one that still had snow on the roof. Now, doesn't that say a lot about what the day was going to be? So when I did my opening as chair of the conference, I used that anecdote. And people think, She's thinking about what she's going to tell us today. She's just not churning out the same material all the time. So always look for something like that. Now, you almost must keep it simple. Keep it simple because particularly if it's a talk or a television interview or a radio interview, people can't go back and reread it. They've got to understand the first time. 
And if you use something that's a scientific phrase that you use in work all the time that the general public don't understand, they're going to stop to think about it, and then they're going to have missed your next sentence. And also avoid, avoid jargon, scientific jargon, all sorts of jargon that you use in your work. There was a lovely one in the House of Commons recently that I saw in the Times. A spokesman for the water companies began referring to something called unaccounted for water. And the chairman, sick of all this jargon, said, I think you might mean leaks. <laughs> and really, you should be pulled up for that kind of thing. So keep it short. If you're doing a media interview, keep your answers short so that it's more conversational. You'll have all heard scientists who are used to lecturing at university. They're asked a question, they go into lecture mode. And four minutes later, the interviewer gets a question in, and the interview is only supposed to be three minutes long. Or politicians, you hear them particularly on the Today program, they say, well, um, thank you for a very interesting question, John. John Humphreys. But before I answer it, I'd just like to say, <laughs> and eight minutes later, and so boring, you've got to keep things short, conversational. And it's the same when you're giving a talk. When people give a talk, they forget that you talk at three words a second, but you read print at 15 words a second. So people write it down, and then, of course, their talk's overrun. Not good. So what you need to do is you need to time your talk by reading it out aloud. Now, you notice I'm not using PowerPoint, using DVDs to varying effect. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's wrong with PowerPoint? I mean, I know you will have to use it in your work to some extent. Scientists use it. But why not try leaving it behind sometimes and just talk to your audience instead? How many times have you been to a conference and you've seen speaker after speaker turn their back to you and then read word for word what's on the screen? So you don't get to see the speaker and they don't get to see you. So how is a relationship being developed? And you've got to remember that basically you are your best visual, not a whole list of boring things on the screen. So don't hide behind PowerPoint. It's been found, actually, that with all emerging technology, that the easier you make it to generate product, the more rubbish gets generated by that technology. There's also been some research just published at the University of New South Wales in Australia, which proves the point of people who say, let's forget PowerPoint. It shows that humans process information best in verbal or written form, but not in both simultaneously. And in fact, it's been shown that PowerPoint works much better for visual ideas. So I do use it for images. I could have shown you an image of Prince Charles, but you've just seen him on film. I could have shown you an image of Madonna, but you know what she looks like. But images are good on the screen. And also the occasional quote that you might feel in the audience you want to go back to and look at a second time because it was such a marvellous quote. So sometimes quotes are worth having. But today I decided not to use it at all, to see if you miss it. And I came here just to talk to you. So I'd like to hear in the question and answer session whether you have missed PowerPoint and what you think about it. I haven't given you any lists to read on the screen because I think PowerPoint, when it's overused, abuses the audience. And I'm saying to you, just be brave. Use it less, or use it not at all. And there are lots of opportunities to go out and talk to people. There are more and more science festivals. It started off with the British Association for the Advancement of Science, then we had the Cheltenham Science Festival, now we have Oxford, Edinburgh, 